Free Run Episode 26. The fact that we're seeing this twice makes me a little bit curious. Is it just a clone killing thing or is it more? I mean, I can only speculate, but there are multiple things that could mean. It could be a symbolic death as well. End of an era, the convenience of being asleep and not caring. Could be Free Run sacrificing herself for Fern. Could be Fern turning evil. Got different opinions about how magic should be used. Fern just gets spoiled to the point where she wants everything and destroys the world. First it's desserts. Next thing you know, it's world domination. We gotta make Fern happy. We gotta make Fern happy. Episode 26, The Height of Magic. What? She's still alive? What? I thought we had dealt with this. But she got Zoltarked. Oh, is this her ultimate attack? Is this her final attack? Oh, I didn't know she could do that. She, she summoned. She summoned Gigas. I totally misunderstood the ending of the last episode. Get Zoltarked again. Okay, all right. Yeah, all right, yeah, I guess this makes a bit more sense. I just free run. Uh oh, I thought we had wrapped this up. This version of those two is a lot more peaceful. They're not at each other's throats. Pick your matchups. This guy just has a hole in his whole chest. He walked in like ready to pass out and now he's fine. Oh, yeah, there's a healing spell. That's what I'm saying. And we have five minutes extra experience of life. Look at these two teaming up. It's too bad Ubal isn't here. I give her a lot of respect. Who, yeah, who fights Dinkle? Does Dinkle fight Dinkle? Oh, that's right. Dinkle fights Dinkle? Oh, yeah, with the hair. Yeah, she's bad. Can't sense, still a sense. That's not fair that she came. Oh, that is scary. Right, because they can, they're good at hiding their mana. Yeah, what the hell? You gotta, you gotta fight, you gotta fight yourself, man. Oh, I was ready, ready to support you. Nah, no, no, this is your fault. Though again, like chess, I feel like the ease sort of stacks. Free run and fur run aside, however powerful any of them individually are, having one greater person in your group fighting the clones on either side stacks the odds. So do you not go from just weakest to strongest, you know, lowest hanging fruit? Right now, rejoin. Thought you would have loved a chance to do. Oh my god! Oh, it's her. It's her. Oh, what? Flasks? Flasks now. Is she already dead? Now! Man, I don't want anything in, badly in life as they want this exam. This license. You need to rejoin the group. You need to regroup. Yeah. Why is this so terrifying? You can see with its hair. Don't be a meat shield, Duncan. Oh, there, where have you been? We could have used you. Let clone guy do it. He's already a clone. Clone against clone. Say less. <laughs> wow. I knew she was missing here. But my good point is, I love killing. Okay. This imagery thing. 
That's really interesting. I can immediately think of a life parallel. There's this problem I've seen reiterated, the same pattern in different instances. The hands-on practical sort of joking way to explain it is that whole, you need five years work experience for this entry-level job. There's a similar thing for presence of mind and confidence and results and action that gives you the result you need to have the confidence you need. Like so many things are made easier and greater just from the self-knowledge or self-confidence that you can do a thing. That gives you like an ease of attitude, an ease of expression. Your mind is less locked up with panic and anxiety and overthinking. You probably process things and think the most clearly when you're relaxed or in a state of non-anxious focus. So if you're working on something for the first time where the results are really critical, but you've never done it before and in order to do it successfully and get the feedback you need, you need to let go and need to believe it's possible. How do you sort of jumpstart that cycle? I think an easy mistake to make in this situation is starting to develop it only when you need it. A very silly example. I see this a lot in nightlife. So people will go out trying to find someone they're attracted to and they'll basically lean against the wall and drink and kind of keep to themselves. And then they'll see someone they're attracted to and most of the time they'll just panic and won't do anything. Sometimes they'll approach the person, but they'll be all panicky because it's such a big deal. They've been waiting all night to meet someone like this. There's a huge chance of rejection. They waited for the last possible second to start engaging with things. Whereas the people who are just there to have fun and like just love being in the place they're in and already have made like a billion minor interactions that day with people they don't particularly care about are already sort of like in that zone. You know, they've like climbed that. So it's not this huge shock of like suddenly interaction at the most difficult instance. How the hell do you expect yourself to be relaxed and confident in that situation? Really, I think the process there is, is more like a gradual build up, starting with slightly challenging, but ultimately very doable levels of the thing and then pushing yourself farther and farther. Simultaneously, I think having a broader narrative is important. Like you can make failure sort of impossible by thinking longer term. So just for example, a way to look at things is I may have missteps and I may not win every battle, every iteration of attempt, but I'm the kind of person, I can decide to be the kind of person that will keep going, will push through obstacles, will keep trying, will learn from my mistakes and I will get what I want eventually. If you like show yourself that long enough, I think then that sort of becomes a more universal trait where you trust yourself and have faith in yourself and can imagine victory even in totally new and unknown situations. It's like, oh, it's just like this. It's just a, another iteration of this thing I've already done with myself. For you able to do this, I mean, it sounds simple. For her to walk into this situation and say, I can cut this. Like she has to say it that way, right? She has to, because that's the only way the power works. But I also feel like if this is a parallel for real life, you can't fake it. You either feel it or you don't. I can do it. I'll cut it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this. That is powerful. Both difficult and powerful magic. It has the potential to be the most powerful thing ever, but also happens to be the most difficult. Here she comes. You, you, wow, you can feel that? Ubel? I wonder what she thinks. Gee, I wonder what happened to him. Ubel just seems like a trump card, her ability. This is a really interesting way to proctor a test because doesn't their victory mean your death? Oh, one step. This also seems unfair. Oh, right. Right. Right, they did say this. Disqualified. That's how it happened. <laughs> You, you are not good at this. You are not good at making exams. This is awful. Honestly, if you're gonna make a, a test step this dumb, you should just let them pass for killing you. That's on you. At first I felt really conflicted because I love the imagery of this. I love the, the thematic underpinnings of it where your power is only limited by what you've developed in yourself and what how far you can visualize, how far you can push that ceiling, your North Star. It's a beautiful image, but contrasted with like, Ubel murdering someone? It's interesting that Ubel has it, has this ability. But on second thought, I, you know, because I hate them, good. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Make stupid exams, get stupid results. You don't have to tell him anything. I don't answer questions. <笑>私も不器用だからそういうことはしたことないんだけど。<笑> 
Maybe she visualizes this. She she knows the feeling. She was just born this way. I do. Everyone is just a cloth. Everyone is made of butter. Yes. <laughs> but she's growing on me. I like her better than the examiners. Why does Ubel have one of the most uplifting and cool powers? Why is she so inspiring? Her character just gets better and better. There's there's such a cool psychological underpinning to it. It's like you, you understand people. You observe. Humbly. Like she's very humble, interestingly. She is quick to admit her weaknesses and faults. It sort of doesn't matter. In fact, it's probably a path to her being able to understand things so well. She is not trying to fill a full cup. Her power comes from figuring people out, understanding people, perhaps in relation to herself. There's a weird kind of empathy there for a, a killer, a cold-blooded killer. And she's only limited by the extent of her self-belief, which is also really cool and empowering. Speaking of bars, again, one sort of visualization thing that helps me that I've experienced, stupid, but when playing beer pong, if I say to myself repeatedly and try to imagine the cup is the size of a garbage can, an industrial sized garbage can, I find that increases my accuracy. I used that to win a, a beer pong tournament years ago. Without the anxiety also, you just get pure talent, ability. I mean, it seems like this is just the rules of her spell. She's just great at visualizing. It could, theoretically. She ignores what she's told. She ignores the obvious. It's low-level thinking. But it's not really true. I mean, it's a self-creating thing. If you can cut through anything by imagining it can be cut through, then it is possible to cut through the thing. She's my superhero in this arc. I'd love to cut a clone of it one day. She won that in visualization war. Whoops. Goodbye. <laughs> she was waiting for this. She's probably been thinking about this since that encounter. That affair, yeah. Understandable. How did she know? How did she <laughs> like how did she foreshadow her own murder? It's certainly seen that way, yeah. Match is really important. I wonder if Ubel could cut free in. What scares Ubel? What would shake her confidence? A lot of people sleep on Fern, though. She knows. Bold. Don't underestimate, yeah. Really drive that point home. Uh, okay, she's dead. Oh, that's good to know. That's a weakness to overcome. Wait, what? I thought, yeah, we killed her. That's not fair. That's cheating. What? We did this already. Okay, that changes the strategy. Forget these things. You Blitzkrieg, Freerin, and the Crystal. They also look especially cuttable, though, so... This will get easier and easier as you go. She's already cut one. That's a huge edge that Ubel has on the Ubel clone. Ubel now has experience cutting through these clones like butter. Ubel clone has not had experience cutting through them like butter. Oh, she saw it. She saw it coming. This is wild. This whole thing is wild. I was about to say, I bet Freeman would probably figure this out. She's endangering herself, yeah. Freeman, you might end up being killed by a human mage. There we go, this is repeating a lot these days, especially in this episode. Oh, honest. Well, you know, Fern will always be her baby, as we established in, I think, episode 17. So cool. There, there are, like, no shots, no frames that are lacking. Here's the opening. 
we did it. We caught a piece of her cloak. All he needs to do is block. Everyone's got it. Oh, the overwhelming force. She's handless. This again, this again, this keeps happening. This is the third time you hesitated. This is what she's been hiding. She's never shown it to anyone. Well, the firm brought it out of her. She's dead now, right? <laughs> High praise. That's the sweetest thing she could have said to her. Quickly. Good. So everyone who's here passes, huh? <laughs> Again. This guy's just doomed to carry them in every stage of the exam. Worth it. Gold worth more than the exam license. You can just buy your way into the mountains now. Oh god, this is not the end. There's more? Leave her in there a bit. What feeling? Yeah, these things are OP, for real. This is the real magic. Some of the test takers don't even know each other. This is such a great episode. There's so many things going on. They made this horrible, horrible exam worth it. Uh, I think the thing I'm struck with most, though, is Yubel. There's something so cool and terrifying about her ability linked with her character. I don't think it's stupid. In fact, I think it's the opposite. So trying to define intelligence as a whole can of worms is not even worth it. But in terms of the things I value, the older I get, the more I experience, the less I care about the sort of standard measures of things and information. I don't really care about data. I don't really care about what has conventionally been true. I mean, I think I do, in my in my way, have a very healthy respect for the orthodox tradition, structure structure just because I recognized it wasn't formed from nothing and probably serves a very important purpose if it exists at all. So it's not that the conventional, the traditional has no value. In fact, it has great value. It's just that a lot of times different things serve different purposes. It's like with humans and our natural instincts, looking at the incentives, right? The, the most important thing is avoiding game over events. It's avoiding death. So our strongest impulses are wired so that at all costs, we avoid danger. That's a great thing, right? But then there's also the domain of given survival, what's optimal. And because those impulses are so strong, it will feel like the optimal thing is the survival, which is not true. Given survival as a base, there's way farther you can push yourself, which might involve some counterintuitive risks or some risks that require you to sort of step through your resistances, which is sort of like a higher cognitive, more difficult thing. The same is true for law, right? Like law is meant as a baseline so that we don't plummet through the cracks of chaos. But the limit of law is that it's a baseline meant to apply very generally. It's not going to be good for every single person in every given situation. The same is probably true for school. You know, school is, is important in society because it's sort of like the lowest common denominator. Like at least we have this, right? This is a viable path. We're not living just in total chaos with youth roaming the street causing havoc. If you focus on this route, you will achieve some minimum viable level of success and survivability in society. Still not the optimal. There's so much higher than that. And I think problems emerge for people who are really ambitious or who have great potential when the, the farthest they can see is that survival line, right? That's all of life. And it's easy to get stuck in that trap because by definition, past that is sort of exceptional. So there are fewer examples of it. And also the majority of people around you will have gone through that system, will have come to identify with it, will think that's the only way, and then and therefore will try to enforce it on you. So I think it's important to, like, while simultaneously respecting the function that these things serve and not trying to, you know, slash and burn all of society, to also recognize that it's kind of on you to imagine the, the limits of what you can do. It's not a great idea, I don't think, to set your North Star by what is common, like what you see. I think you go a lot farther by setting your North Star on like what you genuinely are, what you genuinely feel and what you want and what you can envision. There's something about that that's practice and there's something about that that's iterative, you know? Like you don't get there all at once. You don't throw yourself into the highest level of difficulty that's gonna just absolutely wreck you and destroy you because then that's what's gonna kick in those survival mechanisms and make you flee and, you know, never wanna try again because it's traumatic. But rather, you know, gradually, step by step, pushing the envelope, taking small steps into the unknown, having the adventure. And I think at a certain point that translates into a more general thing where it doesn't really matter the domain you're in. You've established to yourself that this is a formula that works, that you can step out of the, the conventional, you can do your own thing, and you'll survive. And in fact, you, you might even have achieved massive success in a certain area. And I think once you see that, it's hard to unsee. You start to question a lot more. It starts to become a lot more fun to step out of the, the, 
the normal. And in fact, that very thing can be your greatest edge because so few people see it. The bar is set so low. People will think it's stupid, like her reaction to Ubel. This person's an idiot. It's like, no, she actually has pushed herself farther. She's not hemmed in by the obvious. And people will get very mad about that because it shouldn't make sense, right? This is the world that I understand. This is the world that I feel safe in. And they're actually right. Like, it shouldn't work. This is, in name, an unbreakable cloak. But you can rail against that all you want. You can point to the data or the thing you've read or what you've always believed all you want. But at the end of the day, Ubel cuts. And that's kind of all that matters in the context of or as it represents becoming a realized person and getting what you need out of life and becoming who you want to become making your own terms for who you are and how you get there not letting other people's ideological baggage hem you in likely the reaction to people like that from people like the instructors is going to be a mixture of hate and fear which are tightly connected i also think this is one of the ways in life in which you find alpha and by alpha what i mean is like so much of life is dictated just by circumstantial swings you know like things go well and things don't go well at times and a certain amount of that is inevitable because you cannot control the, the extent of all people in the world and all events in the world. And you have to occupy a, a specific time and place in the world. And so you will be swung one way or the other. And so lucky things will happen, unlucky things will happen. Alpha is the edge that you, you get for yourself through clear reflection and conscious deliberate choice. It's like the extra, the surplus on your game. That's really you. The things you tangibly made with your own agency and creative thinking and synthesis. So much of that comes from being able to question the things that are default. I'm devoting all these resources to this thing because that's the way it's done until one day, you know what? I actually don't care about this thing. I care about the thing I think this will help me get, but that thing is there's a shortcut right over there. I could just cut this whole thing out and just go straight for that thing. I don't need this thing. Perhaps no one actually needs this thing. I was told to get this thing because in the past, that is the way that people most tangibly could explain how to get to a level of survival, the baseline. I'm already surviving. I'm going to live for X amount of time. I'm not starving. I'm not in danger of being turned on and, you know, attacked by my primate tribe. Social embarrassment will not destroy me. I can love myself and find a healthy level of self-esteem without people understanding me necessarily. That's perhaps the edge of life. I don't think there's anything unintelligent about that.